You. Finding life rather dull. Dreaming again of exotic places. Wishing you were somewhere else. We. You. Finding life rather dull. Dreaming again of exotic places. Wishing you were somewhere else. We offer you escape. Today, Escape brings you one of the most unusual and terrifying stories of recent years. It is a story of such scope that the producers of Escape, in order to dramatize its full impact, will present it in two episodes. So now, with the performance of John Daner as Isherwood Williams, we bring you part one of George Stewart's powerful novel, Earth Abides. <laughs> If a killing type of virus strain should suddenly arise by mutation, it could, because of the rapid transportation in which we indulge nowadays, be carried to the far corners of the earth and cause the death of millions of people. If you should awake some morning, tomorrow morning, let's say, if you should wake to a man-dead world where virtually all of human life had been dissolved from the face of the earth, leaving behind only buildings, bridges, machines, if you should awake to such a world tomorrow morning, what would you do? Where would you go? My name is Isherwood Williams. I was a student of ecology. I was in the northern California wilderness gathering specimens of rock, plant, and animal life. I was alone and had been for a month. Climbing up to a sharp ledge one day, I felt a sudden sharp pain in my extended right hand. I withdrew it under reflex and looked up, and there, a foot above my head, I saw him, a rattler, coiled, ready to strike again. Slowly, carefully, I lowered myself and began to suck the poison from the bite. I wrapped a handkerchief about my wrist tunicate style and headed for my cabin. There, I broke open my snake bite outfit, cut a neat crisscross in my hand at the point of the wound, and applied the rubber suction pump. Then I lay down on my cot. I felt sick. Sick because of the poison. Sick because I was alone. I was weak. In a few moments, deep, warm blackness closed in about me. I don't know how long I was unconscious, but I was awakened by the door. Harry? Harry, look here. Uh, this one's still alive, I think. Hello. I'm glad you came. I'm sick. He's still alive, all right. Don't go near him. Uh, Come on, let's get out of here. Wait, wait, wait. I'm sick. Come back. Why? why? Why did they leave me when they knew I was sick? What were they afraid of? I tried to stand. My knees were like sponge rubber. But finally, I was able to stumble to my chest of drawers. And then I saw the hammer, my rock hammer, resting on the top of the chest. And it suddenly became the most important thing in the world to me. If I can lift this hammer, I told myself, I will live. I wrapped my fingers about its handle, and I lifted it slowly, then let it down. I breathed a sigh of relief. I would live. In the morning, I felt better. I got up, packed the car, and headed for the nearest town, Hudsonville, about ten miles to the south. They'd take care of me in Hudsonville. Consider, if you will, the case of the rats that once inhabited Christmas Island, a small bit of tropical verdure some 200 miles south of Java. In 1903, a new disease sprang up. The rats proved universally susceptible and soon were dying by the thousands. 
In spite of great numbers, in spite of an abundant supply of food, in spite of a rapid breeding rate, the species is now extinct. Hudsonville. The familiar houses, stores, taverns, but no one on the streets. A hen scratched quietly in the dust. A lonely dog was howling somewhere. I got out of the car and walked into a little restaurant. The place was empty. Hey. Is anybody here? Hey! Silence. Deathly silence. On the counter, I saw a newspaper. I flipped it open. The headline... Crisis. Acute. I read the story, a dispatch from Washington. The federal government is herewith suspended as of the emergency. All officers, including those of the armed forces, will put themselves under the orders of any fun functioning local authority by order of the acting president. Front page, column three. The West Oakland Hospitalization Center has been abandoned. Its functions, including burials at sea, are now concentrated at the Berkeley Center. Keep tuned to your radio. The radio. The radio in my car. I turned the dial to the most powerful station in the vicinity. A static. Nothing but static. Desperately, I twisted it from one end of the band to the other, praying for a human voice, a bar of music, anything. But there wasn't a single radio station still in operation. The horn. Someone will hear the horn. Mm -hmm. Silence and death. I leaned back in the seat, exhausted. I sat that way for minutes before I looked at the paper again. The paper. The last sign of human life left to me. It was dated a week before. And I read it through twice. Whole cities had perished. Medical centers, bodies. Doctors, nurses, burial crews hard at work, and then they too had fallen and died. The United States, the world, a stagnant flesh pool of death. Suddenly, with terror, I thought of home. I started for San Francisco. On the way, I helped myself to a tank full of gas at the station. Oddly enough, the pumps were still working. The electricity still flowed from the river-driven generators, and the lights still blazed. I wondered how I had survived. Perhaps the snake venom had counteracted the virus. Perhaps the... The clean wilderness, who could save? But somewhere, someone else was alive. The men at the cabin door, there must be others, but where? I passed some cows in a pasture. <laughs> Smiled to myself at the irony. The world belonged once again to the animals. Ecological observation. Pedigree means nothing now. The prize, which is life itself will go to the keenest brain, the staunchest limb, the strongest jaw. The champion boars will die in their well-kept pens, but the shoats will roam wild. In a few generations, their legs will grow slim, their bodies thin, their tusks longer. Man? They need nothing from man. I passed four or five cars on the highway, abandoned. But farther along, I spotted another car, and there was a man inside. I stopped and got out. He had fallen over the wheel, and there was a bottle beside him and the strong smell of cheap liquor. I shook him. Come on, come on. Come on, wake up. Wake up, wake up. Wake up, I said. 
come on now, come on. Now, leave me alone. Now, you just leave me alone. I said wake up. Hey. What's your name? Uh, your name. Oh, what difference is it? Now, oh, come on, come on. Don't go back to sleep. What's your name? Barlow. Barlow's my name. Fifty-eight Barlow's in the Seattle telephone directory, and I'm the only one left. <laughs> me. The dirtiest skunk of the lot. What am I doing alive? Answer me that. Go back to sleep, Mr. Barlow. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Here, here, here. It's free. On the house. Everything's on the house now. Have a drink. No, thanks. Uh, let me tell you why I'm still alive. Because I'm being punished. I'm not good enough to die. Oh, goodbye, Mr. Barlow. Uh, no, uh, hey, hey, come on back. I'll, I'll buy you a drink. <laughs> I'll buy you a drink. Look here, I, I got five hundred dollars. I took it from a bank yesterday. You want it here? Five hundred dollars. <laughs> San Francisco, the mute, dead city of San Francisco, a naked forest of concrete with its empty streets, its ghosts of newspapers blowing across alleys. I crossed the Bay Bridge, stretched over the blank water. A single car, coupe, parked in an emergency recess with its sole possessor now. The Bay Bridge. A final monument to the greatness that had been mankind. I drove the familiar route toward home, turned right at San Lupo Drive, pulled up in front of the house. I walked up the stairs, took out my key, opened the door. Strange odor of must and stale food blew out at me. Mom? Dad? Mom! I fell into a chair and cried. Observation. The desert and the wilderness began a long time ago. Men came only in the latter centuries. They camped at the springs and wore faint trails through the mesquite bushes. They laid rails, strung wire, paved long, straight roads. After a while, men were gone, leaving their small works behind them. In a thousand years, at a conservative estimate, man will be a forgotten stone in the jungle. Where would I go? I had no idea. I only knew I had to keep going. Change of place was my only comfort now. The only way I had of convincing myself that there was still life in the world. The snake bite began to hurt again, but it felt good. Some small sign of living flesh. I left San Francisco and started across what had once been the United States. Route 66 through the giant southwest. The town's... The empty, dead towns, the dust-blown, silent towns passed me by, one after another. Kingman, Flagstaff, Albuquerque, Oklahoma City. Just outside Guthrie, I saw a Negro tending his garden as if nothing had happened. He was afraid. He waved me on with a shotgun. In Tulsa, the sprinklers were still going in the park. I stopped. In Fayetteville, Arkansas, I heard music. Came from a little bar. Neon lit, spitting its bright invitation to the empty street. I took my hammer and went inside. The bottles were stacked neatly, bar rag over the rack, and a broken jukebox. 
blazing in blues and reds, singing its song to the vacant, varnished tables. And you just want to jump up oh, and shut down up. like a carnival. Shut up. It's love. Shut up. There's a sparkle shut up. to me. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. up. I slept in the best auto courts and the most luxurious hotels. I slept and ate from the leavings of 150 million people. All the wealth of America had been bequeathed to me. All its wealth and its death. Three days later, I pulled up the Pulaski Skyway, crossed George Washington Bridge, and came to Manhattan. The splendid, slow-decaying corpse of Fifth Avenue, the sable mink in the windows, the silly traffic lights changing color at naked intersections. Manhattan, soulless and dead. Stretched out between its rivers, the city will remain for a long time. Stone and brick, concrete and asphalt, glass. Time deals gently with them. A window pane loosens vibrates, breaks in a gusty wind. Lightning strikes, loosens the tiles of a cornice. The shade trees on the avenues die in their shallow pockets. Bats fly from the 59th floor. City dies slowly. In the afternoon, I saw smoke from a chimney in the Bronx. I drove to the house, a small house, and knocked on the door. I heard footsteps. When the door opened, I saw a little bald man with a broad smile holding a handful of playing cards. Milt Carson, uh, how do you do? Come on in. You're in time for supper. Well, thanks. I just ate. Uh, this is um, Mrs. Carson. How are you? Won't you sit down? Oh, thanks. Where are you from? Uh, California. I had a relative there. We're just finishing a hand of gin. Uh, say, look here. Isn't that a beauty? The, the the television set, yes. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's a combination radio television set, radio player. I'll bet it even does the washing. It, it took us two days to get it up the steps from the radio store. I always wanted a set like that. Yes, but there's nothing on the air. Yes, sir, always wanted a set like that. <laughs> it, Jen, there you are. I owe you $10,000. Well, give it to me tomorrow. There's a busted window at the Chase National. All the money you want. I carry 50000 with me all the time just to be on the safe side. Of course, you can't buy anything with it now, but it sure feels nice to carry around. How about some salami? No, thanks. I just ate. Oh, yeah. Say, do you like canasta? No, not much at cards. Oh, canasta, I could teach you. It's simple, like rummy, but a little different. Um, what I was wondering was... Why don't you stay here? I got everything you'd want right here in the Bronx. Need a coat for the lady? Break a window at I.J. Fox? You should see some of the diamonds I got uh, Mrs. Carson at Tiffany's yesterday. Beauties. Hey, where are you going? I've got to get started. Well, where? There ain't no place to go. Lots of luck. Well, thanks, but I wish you could stay with us. No, thanks. Goodbye. Oh, the scavengers. How long would they last? Through the winter? And it was doubtful. There'd be no central heating. Even breaking furniture in the fireplace wouldn't keep them alive. They were like highly bred spaniels or Pekingese who walked the city's streets at the end of their leashes. They would die with the city a season or two later, pneumonia, accident. The Negro in Oklahoma with his heart to the land, he would survive. Milt Carson and his new wife, no. They were waiting for death at the card table. Two weeks later, I was in San Francisco again. The streets were just as bare as when I left. The lights were still on, but dimmer now. Water flowed still from the faucets. But San Francisco had a new population, the dogs. 
They hunted in packs, all breeds, bound together in the common search for food. Danes, Dalmatians, Scotties, toys, all of them. The dogs had taken over the city. And I decided to move back into the house because of the familiar things. Late one afternoon, I went out to look around the neighborhood. And I heard the yelping too late. As I looked around me, I saw myself being surrounded by dogs. They were hungry, ravenously hungry, and they started to close in. The car was on the street some 50 feet away. If I could make the car... The bulldog made a lunge for me. I kicked violently and started to run. They were after me, some of them running at my legs. He reached the car, opened the door, and slammed it. They climbed to the window, bearing their fangs, their red tongues, wet with hunger. But I was safe. Then the night. And that night, the lights went out. The lights. The lights. Hey, the lights. What's happened to the lights? I looked out over the city. It was black. Black as death. The age of electricity was over. Finished. There were candles. Mom kept them for ceremonial occasions in the buffet, and I found myself hoarding matches and flashlights, candles, piling them up in the corners. There was only night and day. Time had lost its meaning. And I had food and clothing. And then I had books to read. The Bible. And I read the Bible. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. There was a faint but unmistakable light burning that night a mile away on Knob Hill. I got into the car and drove to the light. I parked the car. I reached for my hammer. In the window, a shadow moved. As I approached the door, a flashlight caught me in its glare. I stopped, dead still. I waited for someone to say, put your hands up. Who are you? There was a breath of perfume. That's a nice car. I can pick up a better one on any street corner. Come on in. Thanks. How about some coffee? Yeah, sounds good. How come you didn't find me before this? Well, I just saw the light tonight. I decided to investigate. I saw your light lots of times. Oh? You live down on San Lupo Drive. Well, why didn't you come in? Woman's pride. Man's supposed to come after the woman. Oh, uh -huh. that was before. There are no rules now. No, but they're habits. Want yours black? Yeah, black's fine, fine. I don't want you to think you're the first one I've met. There were five or six others. They saw the light and they came in. They had coffee and I sent them on. What about me? I don't know you. Well, I'm clean, well-educated, healthy, young. Those are the good things. I dislike turnips, canned beans, stupid people. What's your name? You'll laugh. I would laugh. What's your name? Isherwood, my mother's maiden name. Everybody calls me Ish. Well, mine's Emma. Emma and Ish. Nobody's going to write me love songs with that combination. <laughs> no. <laughs> Don't imagine they will. I like you. Coffee will be ready in a minute. Emma, will you come and live with me? I don't know you. What is there to know? That I like you and you like me? That we're both alone. Emma? What? Emma. <laughs> yes. Good. Ceremony. There ought to be some kind of ceremony. Have you a Bible? Bible? On the mantel. I, I've never used it. I just had it. Here. Give me your hand. Now, we shall be together always.
Emma was warm and understanding, a good woman, a healthy woman. Soon there was a baby to be born. I had read some books, but I couldn't read enough. I stood by her during the night and tried to help. When the morning came, we had a son, the firstborn since the great disaster. Then there was, then there was the matter of time. We won't need to know the exact hour. No, that's true. The clocks have stopped, but what's the difference? We eat when we're hungry, and when we're tired, we go to bed. But the months and the years. It's important to know when the year ends. Well, that's what I've been doing out on the porch. What is that thing out there? Well, it's a transit. See, I set it towards the sun, and when the sun reaches the winter solstice, I know that to be the shortest day of the year. And that will be our new year. Well, new Year's Day isn't the shortest day of the year. No, well, December 21st is. And we'll make that our new year. Man's always been trying to get close to that date for the new year, but <laughs> calendar makers always went off. How long will it be? A few days. And then it'll be 1950-what? No, no. That was the old calendar. This will be our year one. The year one. We must call it something. I know. We'll call it the year of the baby. The new life began around the simple problems of Emma, myself, and the baby. The day came when the sun reversed its path. I took my hammer and a chisel. Emma and I had found a tall, smooth rock in what had once been a small public park. In the rock, I carved the figure one. The new beginning, I said to her. The rebirth of man. In the year two... The rats came. San Francisco was overrun with them. They had broken into most of the grocery stores, torn open the cartons, gorged themselves, and gave birth to more rats. They multiplied by the hundreds and then the thousands. Rats, the carriers of deadly bubonic plague. Come quick, they're getting in! Where? Here! It shut through the door. Now get me that kitchen chair. Hurry now, hurry. Here. Here. Uh, they're going to the bedroom toward the baby. Now hold the chair against the opening. I'll nail it later. <laughs> I rushed into the bedroom, taking my hammer with me. There were two of them, tremendous rats. I stationed myself at the crib. One came toward me, unafraid, for the fear of man had been bred out of them. And I flung the hammer at him. Ah! I missed. The rat leaped up into the crib. I threw a blanket over him and flung him to death on the floor. Then I picked up the hammer and threw it at the other one. Dead. Dead. But that was just two of them. Outside, I could hear hundreds squealing, their tiny feet scratching at the walls. How long would it be before they destroyed us? Man was gone now. This was the age of the rats. Escape is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. You have just heard part one of Earth Abides by George Stewart, specially adapted for Escape by David Ellis. John Daner was starred as Ish, with Larry Dobkin as Dr. Stanley, and Peggy Weber as M. Featured in the cast were Michael Ann Barrett, Parley Bear, Ron Brogan, Paul Fries, and Lou Krugman. The special music for Escape was arranged and played by Ivan Dittmars. Next week, Escape will bring you the second half of Earth Abides, truly one of the most gripping and terrifying novels of recent years. <laughs> This is CBS, where you spend an hour with Frank Sinatra every Sunday afternoon on the Columbia Broadcasting System. You. 
Finding life rather dull. Dreaming again of exotic places. Wishing you were somewhere else. We offer you Escape. Today, with the performance of John Daner as Isherwood Williams, Escape brings you one of the most unusual and terrifying stories of recent years. George Stewart's powerful novel, Earth Abides. If you should awake some morning, tomorrow morning, let's say, if you should awake to a man-dead world where virtually all of human life had been destroyed from the face of the earth, leaving behind only buildings, bridges, machines, if you should awake to such a world tomorrow morning, what would you do? Where would you go? This is the year three. My name is Isherwood Williams. It's three years since I returned from the lonely mountain country of Northern California to find that mankind had virtually vanished from the earth. Some unknown virus had scourged him from his high place among animals. His great cities were tombs. His entire civilization was crumbling. I toured the emptiness that had once been called America. From the silent towers of Manhattan to the Golden Gate Bridge, I saw in all ten human beings still alive. In the fourth month after my return to San Francisco, I saw a light on Knob Hill. It was there I found N, who became my wife. Year one, the baby. Year two, we called the year of the rats. Now it was year three. M, the baby, and I were struggling for existence amid the fast decaying wealth of San Francisco. Oh. All right, now be careful. Careful, Em. Is it yeah. funny? Yeah. It always makes me feel like I'm doing something wrong. What? Not breaking into the biggest food store on Market Street. It's not wrong, Em. There's no private property anymore. This city, this grocery store, it's all ours now. But Ish, look. Look at this place. Yeah, the rats left their mark here, all right. There's the answer to their death. They ate all the food they could get at, and they ate each other. Oh, it's how horrible. Yeah, it's a familiar pattern, and the species grows, dominates the earth for a short time, then dies. Now, come on. We'll take a look at the bottles and the canned goods. Ish, look, the labels are gone. They're eaten off. Yeah, well, we'll just have to try to guess at the contents by the shape of the can. Well, the bottles are easy. Here, look. Bottles of real lemon juice. Fine. This should be corned beef. Look at it all. Tons of it. We could live on just this forever. No, no, Em. We can't be scavengers forever. That's why the rats died. Em, we've got to grow things. We've got to bring something new into the world. Oh, come on. Let's get some of this stuff home. During that year, Em and I found whatever we needed for ourselves and the baby in the empty, silent stores of San Francisco. We lived on the spoiling supplies of a million people. One evening, just after dusk, I suddenly noticed a strange, wavering glow in the sky over the downtown area of the city. I called Em to the window. There was a smell of smoke in the air. Fire, Em! Yes. San Francisco is on fire! Yes. Isn't there something we can do? No. If there were, there must be three square miles of flame. What started it, do you suppose? Well, there were no oily rags in the basement. Some gasoline explosion could be any one of a thousand causes. Will it reach the house? No, I don't think so. Wind's blowing it away from us. It'll burn itself out in a day or two. Well, come away from the window. Em. Em, hmm? do you smell gas? I don't know. It smells like it to me. Open the door to the hall. Yeah. Hey, hey. Hey, the hall is filled with it. Hey, we've got to get out of here. 
gas line must have burst. One spark in this place will blow up like a bomb. Baby, I'll get the baby. All right. We'll be safe on the fire escape. Hurry, Em. Here, here, I'll take the baby. Be careful. I'll just hang on to the rail. Now walk slowly. Now, come on. We started down the fire escape. In the distance, the flames were gutting the heart of the city. Parts of Chinatown were already gone. Kept going down the street level, and then we started running. Any second, a spark could blow the building to dust, and we ran, our breath tearing our throats. Back against the wall, Em. The shockwave. Em, is she all right? Oh, my It's all over him. We're going to be all right. We moved to another section of town that had been spared by the fire. The days passed, the days and the weeks. Em and I were growing tired of the canned foods and wanted some fresh vegetables and fruit. But we needed a car. One day, Em and I found a Jeep in a garage. In the storeroom, I found new tires to replace the rotted ones the Jeep had been standing on. Will it work? Mm, well, after two years, hard to say. I'm no mechanic. All the cars to choose from, and we picked something like this. I always wanted a convertible. Maybe a Cadillac or mm-hmm. a Packard. It's more useful, and more durable. Besides... That's all we need. All right, Em. Let's try it. Step on the starter. Mm-hmm. No. All right, now try it. Oh, come on. Come on, start, start, start. Come on. Good. Come on. She did it. One night, several months later, M shook me awake. Ish. Huh? Ish, wake up. Hmm? There's something outside moving around. Huh? Right by the window. Give me the hammer. Be careful, Ish. I'll be all right. I'll come with you. No, stay here. I'll be right back. Who's there? Who's there? Girl. Come here. I won't hurt you. Come here. What are you doing? Uh, Eileen. My name is Eileen. Where are you from? Eileen. Hungry. Well, come on. Come on inside. Eileen. Eileen. Oh, I've been looking all over for you. Eileen, where have you been? Okay, mister. You can put that hammer down. I ain't going to hurt you. Oh, sure. Sure, well, come on inside. Em! Em, somebody's here. Just Eileen and me. She's my adopted daughter. About a year ago, I found her on Main Street in Los Angeles. She was starving. Can't forage for herself, Eileen can't, so I got to take care of her. (laughs) She can't think so good. How long have you been here? About two days, wandering around the city. Nice city, this San Francisco. Wished I'd have visited here when it had people. (laughs) Reckon I really could have had myself a time. I'll get you two something to eat. Well, uh, that's mighty nice. By the way, I sure am an impolite cuss. If my name's Ezra, I don't believe I caught yours. Uh, Isherwood. This is M. Well, Hello. I'm happy to know you. Eileen, looks like we've met up with some real nice people. Ezra and his new daughter Eileen stayed with us made their home in the house next door. Now the year three has passed. We called it the year of Ezra. November, the year four. 
woman came a week ago. She had dark hair, dark eyes. She was alone. Ezra has taken her for his wife. June 9th, year 5. Our second son was born this day. We named him Joey. April, the year six. Two men and a woman have come. George says he's a carpenter. Harry worked in a bank. Well, he'll have to learn a trade. The woman is called Mabel. Ish. Ish, you better come with me. Well, what's the matter? The water. It stopped running in the faucets. Well, maybe it's just a broken pipe in your place. No, I checked, and it ain't just my place. I've checked all the houses around, and there ain't any water running in any of them. Maybe it's a water main under the street. I don't think so. You know what I think? What? I think the water stopped way up in the mountains someplace. Ish. San Francisco's going dry. Two weeks, not a drop of rain. Ezra, we can't go on boiling the water forever. If we're going to live, we've got to get out of here. Yeah, but there's still all them canned goods. Yeah, that's what's wrong, Ezra. We've been living off the old instead of building something new. But we've got to forget that water ran out of faucets and vegetables come in cans. We've got to start growing things ourselves. We will when the time comes, yes. I reckon. You better come quick. What is it, Em? Eileen. What's the matter with her? She must have been drinking polluted water. Typhoid. <laughs> What does the book say, Ish? What are we going to do? Isolate the others. Mabel can nurse Eileen. What do we do for her? What's the treatment? Well, you can't shorten the disease, it says. All you can do is help make it less severe. Now, don't worry, Ezra. We'll do our best. Eileen, she's so helpless. She don't understand. Yeah, but you move in with us. If this thing spreads, it can wipe out all of us. <laughs> Another case. Who is it? George. Move him in with Eileen. Get another bed in there. You won't have to. What do you mean? Eileen's dead. This is the year six, a year of disease and death. I went to the drugstores, walking the misty, dark streets of the city, armed with my medical text, my hammer... I raided the dusty shelves and the long, warm refrigerators of the pharmaceutical departments. The wonder drugs had long since rotted in their vials. Some sulfur was still potent, and I used it liberally. Yet case after case of typhoid broke out. Some lived, most died, including our firstborn. Our little community, upon which I had pinned the hopes of a new birth of mankind, had dwindled from twelve persons to seven... Five adults, only two children. You've got to get some sleep, Ish. How many of us are left, Em? Count them for me. Ezra, George, and Mabel. Our second son, Joey, and Ezra's boy. You and I. Oh, Em. Em, what's the good of starting again? We're being exterminated from the earth, every small being of us, so things can become green again. There are seven of us, Ish. Once there was only me and once there was only you. Alone and separated. There are still seven. Oh, Em. Em, what would I do without you? Go to sleep. Well, you won't make the mistake a second time. Won't be any looking back. You'll forget the trains that used to run... And the tall buildings and the soft food to the earth. Back to the earth, then. Back to the earth. We 
left San Francisco, we few survivors, we packed only the essentials, the machines, the conveniences. We left to the sun and the wind. From this time on, we'd work in the soil. The decay of the old times was behind us now. We went south and east until we came to a watered land, green, with growing things. This would be our Eden. Here, without the memories of a dead people about us, we would begin mankind again. Come here, Joey. Yes, Daddy. Joey, here. Sit down here next to me. I want to ask you some questions. Sure. Now, first of all, what year is this? Well, that's an easy question. The year 15. <laughs> Joey, did you do your reading today? Yeah. Joey, there's something I want to tell you. You know, there were once a lot of people like us on Earth. Millions. You know that, don't you? Yeah, I read about them. They could fly. That's right. Well, someday there'll be millions of people again. And they'll fly again years and years from now. But after I'm gone, there won't be anybody to show them the way. That's why I'm depending on you. Well, what am I supposed to do? Learn, read, study. You're going to lead them someday, Joey, after I'm gone. Don't let them go back. You don't understand. Uh, I think I do. Oh, you will. Oh, look. I want to show you what I made this morning. What is it? It's called a bow. The guns won't be good much longer. The powder will get rotten. The guns will get rusty. You can hunt with this. Kill animals for food. Yeah, look here. See? I carved it out of willow. Then I strung strips of calf hide from one end of the bow to the other. And now watch this. See here? This is the arrow. Right. All right, here. Like this? That's right. Now, now, pull back. Hard. No, 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 no. Hard, hard. There. Now, let go. Boy, that's swell. Can I take it outside and play with it? Sure, but be careful with it. Hey, Billy, look what I got. Hey, Billy! <sighs> it took thousands of years for man to pass from the spear to the bow and arrow. I've just done it in five minutes. This is the year 19. I have gray hair. It's odd to think of myself as an old man. Well, I'm not really 51. There are 19 numbers in a smooth piece of rock in the meadow that I chipped in with my hammer and chisel. My hammer. What would I do without my hammer? Everything is going along well. Quite a farmer now. Community is growing. There are 45 of us. Strangers that drifted in. Babies born. Maybe man is something you can't quite kill off. A stranger named Charlie came in today. I don't like him. He's gruff and hard. And his eyes... I don't like his eyes. <laughs> sure, three men at a time. Gee, Charlie, how'd you do it? Uh, with my bare hands. Came at me all at once. I grabbed two of them and banged their heads together. They cracked like coconuts. Then the other one I knocked down and stepped on his face. Wasn't much left of him after I got through. Gee. It's time for a bed, Joey. Oh, can't he tell one more, Dad? Maybe some other night. Okay. Good night, Dad. Good night, Charlie. Good night, Joey. Will you come tomorrow night? Maybe. <laughs> Great kid you got there. What did you do in the old times, Charlie? Oh, a lot of things. For a while, I was a stickman in Las Vegas. Used to be a fighter, too. A lot of things. You name it. You intend to stay? Sure, I intend to stay. Why not? No other place to go. This is the only good-sized group of human beings I've seen. And believe me, I've been around. Sure, I'll stay. Everybody works. It's the only way we can live. Listen, you. If I want to stay, I'll stay, and I'll stay on my own terms. I don't ask anything from anybody. I live my own way. You better understand that right now. And you better understand something before we go any further, Charlie. I've been elected to leadership in this town, and we aren't a bunch of independent individuals doing what we please. We're a community, working together. 
Either you accept that or get out. We ain't gonna get along, Mr. Isherwood Williams. Then I'm staying. Good night. I don't know. Don't go out there, Ish. Ah, Ish. Ah, Ish is roaring drunk. Where is he? Right outside. Yeah. What's the matter? Is there you afraid? Come on out. Ish. Ish, don't go. Well, well, well. The great issue was. How do you show it? Down that gun, you crazy fool. Let go. Down. Let go of me. You. Isher. Isher, you all right? Never mind me. Get that gun away from him. Get George. Yeah. Where's George? Bring George. Let's see George take this gun away from me. Hey, George, come on and try to take this thing away from me. Hey, what's going on here? Charlie. Give me that gun. Nobody's taking my gun away. It's mine. Charlie. What's well, mine is mine. Stay away. Give me that gun. Stay away, George. Stay away. <gasps> I told him to stay away. George. George. He's dead. All right, you. You've done enough damage with that thing. Hand it over. There's only one answer. Death. Death. You mean kill him? Murder him? No, it's not murder him... You, Mabel, and Ezra, and I, we're the government now. We've been elected to Council of Four. There isn't any government but us. It's, it's not a matter of punishment. It's protecting the community from a menace, and that's what Charlie is. But he was drunk. All the more reason he might do it again. Afraid so, Em. We can't take the chance. We're like a jury. Let's vote. We've got all the facts. The vote's been called. Any questions? Ish, is it right... Is it right to take a human life? To save many lives, yes, Em. It's got to be right. We'll take a voice vote. You first, Mabel. What do you say? Death. Ezra? Death. Em? Well, how do you vote, Em? Death. It's unanimous. We'll carry out the sentence tomorrow morning. The Council of Four had made its decision. This was not killing in passion or rage or hatred. This was the deliberate and sane elimination of an enemy. Early in the morning, we tied Charlie to an oak tree... Ezra took Charlie's revolver. Charlie stared at him with childish disbelief. He gasped, slumped into his ropes, his mouth red with blood, his eyes swollen in death. The power of the new state was born. Carl, New Year. Uh, here, carry my hammer for me. No, it won't hurt you. My hammer, here. No, I don't want it. Why not? It's, it's magic. Ma- magic? My hammer? Aunt Phyllis says your hammer's magic. She says you're magic. <laughs> Carl... 
Try is just a plain, ordinary hammer. No, no. Carl, don't be afraid. No, it's magic. You're magic. Dad. Ah, uh, hello, Joey. Carl, go and play. Sure, Dad. Goodbye, Grandfather. Joey, what's the matter with them? They say I'm magic. My, my hammer is magic. You're a legend, Dad. You're the only one left out of them all. Ezra, George, Mabel, Mother M. All gone now. Only you. The hammer's a symbol. Symbol of leadership. Yes. Yes, that's the way things happen. You're the only one that's lived through from the old times. The only one. The only one. Joey. Yes, Dad? I'm old. Very old. And I can't see very well. Did I make the numbers clearly? Yes, Dad. 48. The year 48. It's all begun again. Life. Generations and generations. Oh, Em. If you could have lived to see your faith come true. And once there were only the two of us, alone and separated. I want to see the old once more before I die. Just once more. The bridge. The Golden Gate Bridge. We're here, Dad. How? How does it look, Joey? Tell me. How does the Golden Gate Bridge look? It's old and rusty, but it, it's wonderful. It's beautiful. Uh, is there a car, a small car on the bridge? Yes, Dad, it's uh, still there. Uh, can you still see buildings across the water? Oh, only a few, Dad. It's mostly overgrown. But the hills behind the city are beautiful good. today. Good. Joey, hmm? here... Here's the hammer. Yes, Dad. You're the new leader now. And the hammer has always been the symbol. Pass it on to the best of them. And, uh... Joey, don't let them make a god of you. Let knowledge be the watchword. Oh, will you understand, Joey? I understand, Dad. Know the earth, Joey. Know the earth. Dad. Oh. Men go and come. But the, the earth abides. Escape is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. You have just heard Earth Abides by George Stewart, especially adapted for Escape by David Ellis. John Daner was starred as Ish with Peggy Weber as M. Featured in the cast were Michael Ann Barrett, Parley Bear, Jeffrey Silver, Paul Fries, Lou Krugman, and Larry Dobkin. The special music for Escape was arranged and conducted by Ivan Dittmars. <laughs> Stay tuned now for Make Believe Town, which follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations. Roy Rowan speaking for CBS, where you spend an hour with Frank Sinatra every Sunday afternoon on the Columbia Broadcasting System.